This is the worldview in five minutes. I'm Adam McManus. Fox News reports that the trial for two Christian pastors in Sudan has been postponed until next week. Pastors Yat Michael Ruad and Peter Yan Reith from South Sudan were arrested on a visit to the north, and they both face execution. Ed Lyons from the Persecution Project told the worldview that international pressures and news reports are extremely important to save Christians in these trials. You can get angry when you read about news accounts like this, uh, but we also need, as Christians, to get active for the persecuted. We're getting active and helping those that are being persecuted. The article mentions Miriam Ibrahim. She's the Christian woman that was in prison last year in Khartoum, and much public outcry against her death sentence that was handed down for her really helped move the Khartoum government to release her. We participated in demonstrations up in D.C. in front of the North Sudanese uh, embassy and in front of the White House. After the genocides and mass murder of millions, the Muslims in Turkey have reduced the Christian population from 20% to 0.2%. Now, the International Humanitarian Relief Foundation is pushing to turn the last Christian icon in Turkey, the Hagia Sophia, into a Muslim mosque. Breitbart reports that the IHH led protests in the city of Istanbul to that effect. The Hagia Sophia was the seat of the Eastern Church until 1453. Do not bring your tired, your poor, your persecuted to America anymore. That's the message Assyrian Christians are getting. Christian News reports that the U.S. State Department is denying visas for Christians. The department reportedly informed Bishop Julian Dobbs, quote, There is no way that Christians will be supported because of their religious affiliation, unquote. Assyrian Archbishop Bashar Warda says that Christians have suffered the most persecution and the worst acts of genocide in all of Iraqi history. By contrast, annual Muslim immigration to America has doubled recently. National Review reports the rate at 100,000 per year. Record temperatures and stifling heat are the reasons behind the loss of 1,100 lives in southeastern India this past week. Temperatures reaching as high as 122 degrees puts the lives of construction workers, the elderly, and the homeless at risk. Meanwhile, a total of eight lives have been lost in flooding in Texas. First lesson from this, fear God. For he says, quote, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things, unquote. Isaiah 45, 7. Fox News reports on a charter school in Nevada that would not allow Christian children to use Bible verses in their writing assignments. The Liberty Institute intervened and elicited an apology from Somerset Academy. Liberty Institute President Kelly Shackelford told Fox News, quote, it's unlawful discrimination and it's morally wrong, unquote. Another Las Vegas public high school has put the kibosh on a pro-life club seeking recognition. Life News reports that the Thomas More Legal Organization has sent three letters complaining of the unfair treatment of students for life to no avail. In the breakdown of the family in the Western world, Chile comes late to the game. It was the last nation in the Western world to liberalize divorce laws in 2004, now Chile is working on its first attempt to legalize abortion. Newly elected President Michelle Bachelet is pro-abortion, and she is pushing for a law that would allow parents to abort undesirable children. The legislature's health committee is still considering the legislation, while recent news reports indicate 70% of the nation sadly supports its passage. Ireland fell to the homosexuals last week. Now, the Irish Times announced that the repeal of the nation's abortion law is, quote, very doable, unquote. The government will begin with allowing abortion only for, quote, undesirable children, unquote, with fetal abnormalities. God provided a brief comment on these stories. In Romans 2, because of your hard and penitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Christian musician Chris Tomlin's Love Ran Red Tour has attracted 200,000 attendees and raised $700,000 for Cure International, 
an organization that provides surgeries for children with deformities. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. While nations collapse, families dissolve, and babies are killed around the world, the Zanger family has just topped 100 grandkids and great-grandkids. When this Illinois family does its Thanksgiving get-together, it's 50 pounds of ham and 10 turkeys. ABC News reports that Leo and Ruth Zanger just welcomed their 100th grandchild into the world. In Leo's words, quote, The good Lord has just kept sending them. We could start our own town, unquote. And maybe they will. And that's the world view in five minutes on this Wednesday, May 27th, in the year of our Lord, 2015. I'm Adam McManus. Seize the day for Jesus Christ. A large segment of America's unborn population is being labeled incompatible with life. Today's medical establishment is pressuring parents to abort their babies if ultrasounds show evidence of a chromosomal disorder called trisomy 18. It is also known as Edwards syndrome or T18. Trisomy 18 affects 1 in 2,500 unborn children in the United States. This syndrome gives a baby 3 of the 18th chromosome instead of 2. It is the second most common trisomy, with Down syndrome being the first. The Worldview News recently interviewed Brad Smith, who has become somewhat of an advocate for children with T18 since the birth of his daughter. She has trisomy 18. An easy way to explain this, trisomy 21 is Down syndrome. It's an extra chromosome of the 21st chromosome. You have a, a long arm and a short arm, so you have a pair of chromosomes, and one of those replicates, and you end up with three. So instead of having the normal 46 chromosomes that we have, you, you have 47. Just as with Down syndrome, trisomy 18 reveals itself in a variety of developmental delays. However, many of T18's characteristics are life-threatening, and thus, the disorder has lower survival rate than Down syndrome. Those that are, are you know, in the womb, conceived in the womb, I've, I've seen numbers that it's like 1 in 3,000 conceptions is a trisomy 18 child. 1 in 8,000 is a live birth. So you have a lot of miscarriages of trisomy 18 children. Smith has spoken with many parents and doctors who are familiar with trisomy 18. He is certain that children with this disorder would experience a higher survival rate if the medical establishment considered themselves accountable to a higher moral standard. Of those that do make it out of the womb alive, um, 90% of them do not reach their first birthday. I think there are great reasons for that. I, I, don't, I don't think it's because they can't. I, I think it's because we don't treat them. Over six years ago, Brad Smith and his wife, Jessie, received the results of their ultrasound, which revealed that their little girl had calcification in her heart and multiple cysts on her brain. Both of these could indicate that she had trisomy 18. Their doctor recommended amniocentesis, a test of the amniotic fluid. This test would show if their daughter had trisomy 18. Brad and Jessie refused the test, as the test has the potential to cause a miscarriage. They informed their doctor that they wished to carry their daughter to full term, regardless of her genetic makeup. However, their doctors repeatedly pressured them. It started with the abortion push, uh, that they wanted us to abort. And we refused that, and, and very strongly refused it. From the very first moment it was even mentioned, we refused it strongly. And he came back to it several times and, and essentially did it this way. He's like, are you sure that you don't want to have an amniocentesis? You know, are, are you positive? You know, he kept coming back to it several times. And he told us that this, you know, how hard this was going to be. It was going to screw up our other children. It's going to mess up our marriage. Uh, I mean, they really put pressure. It's, it's amazing the kind of pressure and the, the manipulation. Little Faith Smith was born to Brad and Jesse two days before Christmas in 2008. The doctors were not immediately sure if Faith had trisomy 18, but a neonatologist found that she had at least one large hole in her heart. He called in a cardiologist who was positive that Faith was a good candidate for heart surgery. Meanwhile, some genetic tests revealed that Faith did have trisomy 18. Although Faith's cardiologist had initially been eager to perform her heart surgery, 
he decided not to operate once he had seen the genetic results. He told Faith's parents that they should let her die. Brad and his wife refused and instead researched their options. Our daughter wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for connecting with another trisomy 18 parent who gave us, you know, gave us information that doctors literally were not willing to provide to us and having to fight to find people who would provide that treatment. Faith is now six years old. Brad Smith testifies that God has miraculously healed most of the holes in Faith's heart without surgery. The Smiths have found that they are closer to each other and more loving as a result of having faith in their family. We need her because of what she teaches us. If there's one thing I can say that my daughter has done in our family, and especially in me, has made me a much, much more compassionate man. How can a little girl with trisomy 18 work such a transformation? Though some things are difficult for her, Faith has a rare talent. Uh, one thing she does very well is uh, love people. And and she is she's very good at doing that. And, and she doesn't have all the baggage going with it. Smith says that trisomy parenting is challenging, but it is a challenge that has made his marriage even stronger. I mean, my wife and I are far closer than, than we were before this. And so I wouldn't, in many ways, I know it sounds crazy to some people, I wouldn't trade it for anything. As hard as it is and can be, I I wouldn't trade it for anything of of what it's taught me and what I've learned and and what I've seen it do and, and our whole family. The biggest challenge has been getting proper treatment for his daughter. Smith says that the majority of doctors do not value trisomy 18 children. He says his negative hospital experience during his daughter's birth is almost universal for trisomy 18 parents. Our story is, is not abnormal at all. And in fact, our, our story when it comes to a trisomy 18 child is pretty much the norm. I could, I could speak to you for probably an hour or two just telling you stories of other people and what's happened to them, what doctors have said to them, how they've been treated, mistreated. You know, I've watched children die who were, who were allowed to die. I've, I, we've helped keep kids from dying that doctors were trying to let die by getting them appropriate help. Smith has walked alongside the parents of baby Eliana Coy, whose story has attracted worldwide attention. Eliana also has trisomy 18, and her parents were also told she was incompatible with life. Eliana was born in December of 2014, two months early, with holes in her heart and cysts on her brain. Eliana responded well to initial care, and she outlived her doctor's predictions. But at this point, her doctors revealed a surprising unwillingness to help Eliana further. They thought this child was going to die, so they were helping the child. But when it, the child wasn't dying and the parents started pushing for more and more help and started looking for second opinions and started asking the doctors to look for second opinions in other hospitals, that's when the doctor flipped and he got frustrated. And he looked at the parents and he said, We have gone above and beyond what we ever even should have done for this child. Eliana's doctors began to talk about removing her breathing support and said to Eliana's parents that they should let her die with dignity. But Eliana's parents were not ready to give up. They researched their options and found a doctor who could immediately provide a less invasive heart surgery. Now Eliana is four months old and her heart is strong. Tests have shown that her brain cysts have miraculously disappeared. God has been good to his little daughter. Eliana's mother told 10TV that doctors may have deemed her incompatible with life, but she is not incompatible with love. Her parents chose the name Eliana because it means, my God has answered. Most parents of children with trisomy 18 have received similar pressure to abort their children before birth or to cut off food and oxygen after birth. And many have listened. Doubtless, great wisdom is needed to understand God's will for the life and death of each trisomy 18 child. But the alarming death rate of T18 babies seems to be a result of many doctors not giving parents all the information on the treatments that are available. The statistics against an unborn baby with any kind of genetic disorder are sobering. 75% of babies with Down syndrome are aborted. Over 90% of babies with trisomy 18 are aborted. Smith says that many doctors don't value these children or consider them deserving of life. A favorite slogan of the German eugenics movement was, Life unworthy of life. 
In 1939, German scientists loaded disabled children in buses and dropped them off at what they deceptively called a treatment home. Instead of being cared for, the children were gassed or starved and their bodies burned. Two years later, the Nazis were targeting the Jews. Brad Smith finds scary similarities to today's medical practices. We're frighteningly close to that. And I wouldn't even just say close. We're doing it just in a different way. We're not using gas chambers. Um, now we do it in the womb. This is a spiritual battle, Smith says. This is evil. This is not just simply misunderstanding that, that many people have. There is, there is truly evil that we are fighting, and, and, and it is a battle. There is no doubt about it. It's a battle. And do we, you know, we don't war against flesh and blood, but Satan uses flesh and blood. Brad Smith has since spoken at medical schools on the topic of ethics issues. He says that medical students are not given an absolute ethical standard to apply to their patients. Instead, they come up with their own view of ethics as a class. This method provides a shaky foundation for doctors who have to make life and death decisions every day. Doctors have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. We've, we're developing a heart for doctors because what we're coming to see is that they don't have any hope. But there is hope for future babies with trisomy 18. A growing number of doctors are embracing the value of life. We have some incredible doctors who we tremendously respect and love. Um, and, and I mean, we have a list of doctors that we make sure when we find parents, we send them to these doctors so that they can get help. Um, and we even have a doctor that we're working with who wants to start a trisomy clinic, which doesn't exist. The church also has a primary biblical responsibility to protect the weak and helpless. Proverbs 31 says we are to open our mouths for the mute and for the rights of all who are destitute. True religion is defined as visiting orphans and widows in their distress. How are we treating those that, that are the weakest among us? You know, children in general are, are considered the weak among us, but even more people who are disabled because they are so dependent upon us. Overall, I think the church has a lot of work to do in terms of how we handle and deal with anyone with special needs. You know, not just my child, but, uh, but anyone. Especially, I would say, especially when they're not children. Especially as they get older. The psalmist understood that every unborn child is reliant upon God's hand for survival. He wrote in Psalm 71, Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. This is Brenda Swanson for the Worldview Network. Dads, is it time to get away with your sons to build those important relationships? Remember, fruitful relationships is what it takes to have a fruitful life. And how you disciple your son has everything to do with building those relationships. Here's an opportunity for you. Don't miss a once-in-a-lifetime experience at our father-son retreat at the Crooked Creek Ranch in the Colorado Rockies this September. This year... We will be featuring speakers like Scott Brown, Dan Einerson, Steve Vaughn, and yours truly from the Generations Radio Program. You'll enjoy outdoor activities, training sessions like wilderness first aid, mountain survival, blood tracking, as well as sports activities, swimming, high ropes course, rock climbing walls, kayaking, and hiking in the beautiful Colorado Rockies. It all happens September 3rd to the 6th at the most fabulous retreat center in the Colorado Rockies. Register today for our father-son retreat at coloradofatherson.com. That's coloradofatherson.com. Welcome, my friends, to the Generations Radio Broadcast. Kevin Swanson, your host, coming to you from my basement out here in the eastern plains of Colorado, where we've been raising five children over the last 22 years. And my friends, we've got some serious work to do uh, in our homes. Today we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about the relationship of, of how we should be working with our families versus what's happening in the civil magistrate. And um, I ran for governor of Colorado in 1994, ran for U.S. Senate in 1998, going to clean up the world. And then I realized maybe I ought to go home and start being faithful in small things. And uh, God has provided me a family. God's provided me a church community. I've got responsibility to work with what I've got here and now. And as it turns out, most of the work that's done in the world happens in the grassroots. It happens from the bottom up. 
And there, of course, it begins with regeneration, the hearts of ourselves and our kids. And as we disciple them in the Word of God, they begin to bloom. They begin to affect the lives of others, and the kingdom just grows from there. Well, that's, that's the vision, friends, for the kingdom of God. And today, Greg Jackson is going to join me. Uh, he is a, an author. He's been a radio announcer himself. He's been in the conservative Christian group for a number, a number of years. He's written books like uh, Conservative Comebacks to Liberal Lies, We Won't Get Fooled Again, When the Christian Right Went Wrong. And uh, he's got a new book out called 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before They Die, or Before You Die. And uh, now Greg Jackson joins me. Hey, Greg, it's good to have you with us. Kevin, I appreciate it, brother. I love the introduction because it goes really right to the heart of the matter of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, you had an epiphany. Today. You had an epiphany. I had an epiphany. Yep. Hit me in 1998. Yep. You know, I was out there trying to change the world. I was student body president of a major West Coast university in the 1980s and then on to the gubernatorial race here in Colorado in 94. And, you know, I had an epiphany change in 1998 when I realized, you know, God had put a son in front of me, uh, four daughters as well, but. My son was crying out for dad. He wanted more time with dad, and uh, he needed me to be discipling him. And I was too busy writing books and changing the world than to change the <laughs> world of one little boy. And then I realized, you know, that's what God had called me to. And so, you know, my, my life changed. My son traveled with me. He was with me for a long, long time as we crisscrossed the nation and, and did homeschooling conferences and such. But, you know, I, I went through that epiphany, and it sounds like you, you kind of had something like that happen to you as well. Absolutely. We had very similar stories. Yeah. Talk, when my son was it. born, I was on the radio in Boston and WRKO, um, you know, and, and feeling very good about myself that I could take on the liberals in Boston and shoot down all their arguments. Of course, I wrote the book, as you mentioned, Conservative Comeback to Liberal Lies. It sold over 100,000 copies. It was endorsed by a who's who of quote unquote conservative. Big mucky mucks, you know, like David Limbaugh and Phyllis Schlafly and, uh, and others, you know, Dr. Thomas Sowell. And so I kind of, you know, was kind of feeling good, you know, emceeing the presidential sessions at the Conservative Political Action Conference and uh, introducing, excuse me, all the presidential candidates in 2007 and again in 2008. And, you know, I think really the Lord was, was allowing me to do that um, as kind of teachable moments in my life to let yeah. me see kind of peek behind the scenes, if you will, or behind the curtain, um, kind of how the sausage is made. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the sausage was not a pretty sight. No, the sausage wasn't a pretty Well, I wasn't a pretty sight, mm. because what, I, what, what the Lord really opened my eyes to, Kevin, is that um, I had a, my biggest, you know, some people have drugs and pornography and whatever. My biggest thing has really always been my pride. Mm-hmm. And um, I always had to win the argument. Um, always, always, and that's why you know I wrote my book, Conservative Comeback to Liberal Lies, to refute all. And by the way, most of the lies of the liberal left, they're still lies, and they still need to be refuted. I'm not saying that, but what what I am saying is that when it was brought to my attention one day when I was on the air on WRKO, which is the oldest talk radio uh, station in the country, in Boston. Uh, one of my callers called me and he said, Greg, and I talked to him after the show. The gentleman's name is John Haskins, and he called me and he said, he became a dear friend after that. He said, Greg, I do, you know, I'm conservative like you and Christian, but I want to correct you on some things that you've been saying about Mitt Romney because I supported Mitt Romney for president. Uh, and I introduced him at the Conservative Political Action Conference and, uh, you know, gave him, gave him an autographed copy of my book. And he said, you know, I, 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 I think you need to understand that this guy's record isn't what you think. And he presented me with the Mitt Romney deception, which is on the Internet. It's called the Mitt Romney deception. It's all documented. It shows how he's the founding father of same-sex marriage, falsely claiming the courts ordered him to issue the marriage licenses, that how Mitt Romney's Romney care subsidized abortion on demand at 50 bucks a, a, you know, a pop copay. And all these things, I always forced Catholic charity to give away children to same-sex couples, and I was blown away by it. And, mm-hmm. uh, but the bottom line was this. He said, Greg, you know, I've been listening to you for a long time. And he was very gentle with me. He said, you know, I, you're, you're constantly defending George Bush and the other Republicans, but did you realize that George Bush, you know, increased funding to Planned Parenthood at a greater rate than Bill Clinton? Mm-hmm. I said, no, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And so he really... I think God used him and, and, and others really to, um, to open my eyes that the Republican Party was my idol. 
My yeah. worldview, Kevin, was the more Republicans that we can elect, the better off this country is going to be. And I knew every Republican in every district in the House and the Senate and, you know, who, what appointees were Republican appointees on the court. I believe the lie that the Supreme Court is supreme and that we were only one vote away from overturning Roe v. Wade and that abortion was going to be ended when you and I both know that we're actually uh, five votes away, that there's not one Supreme Court justice who believes that babies in the womb possess a God-given right to life. But as, that was where my epiphany really kind of came about, where I, the Lord just hit me on the side of the head that, Craig, you are idol- you have a serious idol in your life, and it's the Republican Party. And it's your pride. And it's the belief in the Hegelian dialectic, the false right-left dichotomy. And like you, Kevin, I was out to change the world, and yet I have a newborn son at home, and I'm rushing off to the radio station to do all these speaking engagements for the Republican Party of Texas and women's group and all this stuff. And, you know, he basically had the same epiphany you did, which is, hey, you need to start being a good dad and a good husband, first and foremost, and then you can go out and save the world. Yeah. You know, I think, Greg, we figured out that uh, that politics isn't as much as it's cracked up to be. There's a lot of hypocrisy about American religiosity. There's a lot of hypocrisy about American politics. And we, we develop this brochure that looks really, really good, but everything behind the brochure is... Is, is nowhere near as good as it ought to be. We're the whitewashed sepulchers that Jesus talk, talked about, and we try to present something politically that's not represented in the rank and file. Mm. It's not represented in the churches. It's not represented in the families. We think that there is a heartland in America, but the heartland's all about Casey Musgrave singing about lesbianism. The heartland's, you know, all yes. about uh, one-night stands and getting drunk. And, you know, I'm talking about the mm-hmm. best country music presented on top 40 country stations is 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 grotesque it's it's a grotesque violations of god's laws at every point it represents the dysfunctionality of america and and yet you know country music is supposed to be the republican heartland of america but it's not it's <laughs> and it just it just shows you that well. the underbelly of america is <laughs> is is in trouble it's it's in in terrible trouble so for me i just felt it was important to go home be faithful mm-hmm. and raise my children in the fear of God and, uh, you know, be faithful in small things. And, and really, the nation will never be changed unless families and, and, and churches are restored and reformed. We're not going to change America with a uh, hockey mom from Alaska who's got another kid with a kid born out of wedlock. And I've used that <laughs> phrase many, many, many times yeah. because it points the finger at all of us. I'm not trying to point the finger at one individual here. I'm pointing the finger at an entire system of conservative mm-hmm. families, most of whom's children and, and family lives are a wreck. And uh, so until there's repentance, you know, mm. down here in the grassroots, until we begin to see families reconstructed and, uh, and reformed according to the Word of God by, you know, following the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll never see politics improved in this country. Absolutely. You know, God ordains three forms of government, and the first one is the natural human family, and of course, corporately is the church and then civil government. And the problem, uh, I think, has been, and we uncover this in our book, We Won't Get Fooled Against, your good buddy Steve Dace and I co wrote the book with me, which is that for far too long, the GOP uh, has been elevated above the GOD. And that has, you know, we've elevated the flag above the cross, if you will. Yeah. And God won't bless that. And, and until and unless we take an honest inventory and assessment of the role that we as the Church, we as Christians have played in that, God's not going to bless that. Because, you know, Jesus was explicitly clear, Kevin, that, you know, before we attempt to remove the, uh, you know, speck of dust from our neighbor's eyes, we've got to take that big nasty old plank out of our own, right? Yeah. And so... That's where I believe we're at in America. And by the way, can I just say, can I get an amen on this, Kevin? Because I believe that it's freeing. It's cathartic. When you're free, and by the way, I'm not suggesting for a moment that Christians not take part in politics, Mm -hmm. in elections, in civil government, in running. Maybe God will elevate you and enlarge your territory and platform, and maybe you will run for governor. I think you'd make a great governor here in Colorado, because I know exactly what you do, and we'd be blessed to have you. But 
the bottom line is it will be as a result of your obedience to the Lord that he expands your territory and your domain. And the fact of the matter is, yes, I do believe that we as Christians should take part in voting, in civil government, at the le- you know every branch and level of government. I'm not for a minute saying that we shouldn't. But most importantly, we got to do what you were talking about, which is making sure that we have things right in our own homes and then corporately in our own churches before we go out and change the world. And we put the cart before the horse, thinking that a change in Washington is what we need, when it's really, it's a change in our own homes. Be faithful in Potiphar's household, be faithful in the jail ministry, and then maybe Mm -hmm. God will make you the second most powerful person in the world. That's right. Amen. Great analogy. Yeah, that's the way it was with Joseph. Yeah. Let's get back to the book, and this this is, is critical here. Now, granted, I think that Palin needs a copy of your book, Conservative yeah. Comeback to Liberal Lies, but I think before she gets a copy of that, I'd recommend 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die. I, I, I think this book belongs in the hands of conservative in America. We, we need to be raised in our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Of course, that's Ephesians 6, 4. And you've summarized some of these basic, basic lessons. In fact, the Apostle Paul doesn't have a whole lot to say about who you're going to vote for in the next election, but he does say, fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So he, he does say that. So you, you went ahead and took that seriously and wrote the book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die. Why did you write the book? Yeah. Why did you write this book? Well, well, a couple of years ago, and this is a true story, I was cleaning out our safe in the basement, and my wife and I, and it got me thinking, you know, if I die, it got me thinking of my mortality. It tends to do that when you deal with safes and stuff like that, where you keep your possessions. And I thought, you know, when I die, i got to leave, leave Jake something. You know, i got to write a book for him or something. Uh, and I made a list, Kevin, of essentially the things that I deemed important enough they were essentially the opposite of what the world are teaching our kids in the in the media and the culture and the society where they're being brainwashed with an anti-Christical, anti-biblical uh, worldview. And so it really, you know, thinking about, you know, if I die prematurely, I'm 46, but if I go and, you know, but, 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 you know, early in life, I'll, at the very least, I wanted my son to have something. And I made a list, Kevin, and that list became this book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die. Mm-hmm. Which is essentially, you know, the subtitle is The Simple American Truths About Life, Family, and Faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that, you know, that, that I believe that, as you rightly state, we are, have a solemn obligation, Kevin, as, you know, of your four kids and of, of my son, who's nine, to be their primary moral and spiritual instructors. It's not primarily the, the church's obligation, your Sunday school class. Or my kid goes to a, a you know a Christian school, and thankfully our his teacher has a very very strong biblical worldview. Already t- he taught the kids the other day that you know Heather has two mommies is baloney, mm-hmm. and that God defined and you know the natural human family it's one male one female, but not all parents have that. Mm-hmm. But it's the parents' responsibility to teach their children what God says about life about the sanctity of human life, about marriage, about when life begins, about what biblical government looks like, that we are supposed to judge, that God explicitly calls us to be, to to render judgment, not in a hypocritical manner, but but that we, even though the world says not to judge, that we are to, uh, that ultimately, Kevin, that one man, one of my chapters is one man with God makes a majority, Mm -hmm. that ultimately we don't follow the crowd, we do what is in accordance with God's Word. These are simple things, mm-hmm. that, by the way, and I'm not blaming my parents, but I didn't grow up in a religious home. I'm a born-again believer in Jesus. I have Jewish blood in me, so I'm a completed Jew, Messianic Jew, whatever you want to call me. Mm-hmm. And by God's grace and mercy, I came to faith in 2001, right before 9-11. My parents didn't teach me these things, but, man, do I feel a real, real strong uh, 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 just burning my bush on to our children. Amen. We have an obligation to, Kevin, Amen. to our posterity. Amen. Greg, 150,000 things to teach them out of the Word of God. I mean, there's a lot of lessons there. You could have gone through the entire book of Proverbs, some 947 mm-hmm. lessons. You chose 40. <laughs> how did you, how did you yeah. choose the 40? Well, I think well, I pared it down a little bit, and I grouped a couple things together. Um, 
but I wanted it to be short enough that uh, children and young adults and college kids and, and adults would read, because you know as well as I do in the information age, people just don't have time for three, four, five hundred page books. On, on, and I wanted a, a resource that when I'm ride, driving my kid to school, you know, he's playing on his iPad, I say, hey, before you play on your iPad for ten minutes, I want you to read this chapter of this book and let's discuss it. Uh, and so basically I, I, I made a list myself, Kevin, and it's basically, like I said before, and, and it's not an exhaustive list. Parents have added to this. There's a lot of homeschool parents that have this book. They use it as part of their curriculum. They add to it. It's not a substitute for the Bible by any means. It's meant to lead your children into more in-depth discussion of the Bible and God's Word and to all of the Proverbs. I wanted something that was, that was uh, going to be a very, very brief synopsis of the main things. If I were on my deathbed, Kevin Swanson, and had two hours to live, these are the things that I'd want my little Jake to know. And it is, it is really amazing, Kevin, because what I, what I realized in writing this book is, you know, I had some godly input from people that you and I are friends with here in Colorado that I respect, Christian brothers mm-hmm. uh, and sisters. And as I, I kept whittling it down and whittling it down, and I'm verbose, as you can tell from this interview, <laughs> but uh, that's my biggest problem. But what I've realized is that the, that the subtitle, it's the simple American truths about life, family, and faith, that these are things are so simple, we often, we, we overcomplicate, like, for example, marriage. My chapter on marriage, Kevin, is three sentences, brother. <laughs> God ordained it, he established it, he defined it, and man can't redefine what God has defined. My son, who's nine years old, understands that. I guarantee you that 99% of our elected representatives at the state and federal uh, uh, levels don't understand that rudimentary, simple concept. But if there's any hope for revival and reformation, like you talked about earlier, it's going to be the result or to the deg- contingent upon the degree to which our children and the next generation understand these very simple truths, because we've overcomplicated them, and they're not that complicated. And you're addressing the humanist heresies of the day as well, at the same time. You've got the negative, you've got the positive. For example, truth is not relative, the Bible is God's truth. Those are two sections. So you're going to be hitting some of the the, the major heresies of the day, evolution, <laughs> uh, yep. you know, relativism, uh, the, the various isms that have destroyed and eroded the modern world. Our kids need to know these things. They, they right? They, they're walking out into a world that's just sunk into relativism, pragma, pragmatism, uh, evolutionism, uh, existentialism. All the isms. They've got to know something about those isms, but also the biblical answer to those isms. Absolutely, and and you know, Kevin, the the bottom line is this. I don't know if America is coming back. In fact, I doubt that America, as we once knew her, is coming back like so many people yearn for when the, in the 50s when the chrome was thick and the women were straight and everybody wants their... I saw an Ike, uh, I like Ike bumper sticker the other day. I had to laugh. But people are yearning for that, nostalgic. And, you know, I miss it, too. I miss the way things used to be, even when you and I were growing up in the 80s. You know, it was a simpler time. And I can appreciate that. I don't think America's coming back, but I know one thing for sure, Jesus is. And I want to prepare my son, because it might be in our generation, or I know things are getting closer, lining up, you know, eschatologically. Um, things are lining up that we are very, very close. And I know one thing that the Bible teaches is that we, as the bride of Christ, are to be ready. Yeah. We're to be ready spiritually. And I want to make sure I've done everything possible so that my son's ready, so that he's not deceived. Because the deception, as you know, is so great, Kevin, and all those isms that you mentioned, uh, you know, it's cosmic humanism. It's, it's everything. Is, it, it's, if you could wrap it all up, it's all Satanism, because it's all anti-Christical, anti-biblical, um, whatever you want to call it, whether it's humanism, secular humanism, uh, you know, paganism, uh, cosmic humanism, utilitarianism, Jacobi, J- J- Jacobism, whatever you want to call it, moral relativism, it's all the same. Our kids are being steeped in it, indoctrinated in it, and I love my child so much. that if you love your child, you've got to inoculate your children. And the greatest disease of our time, Kevin, 
isn't the Spanish flu, or and by the way, I'm not saying that we're not going to face those type of pestilences because the Bible talks about it. We got Ebola and stuff, but the greatest cancer of our time, I believe, is 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 the is the idea that God's law is not the transcendent moral authority by which we live our lives. And for 300 years of American history, even predating our founding, that was the central ethos, the the zeitgeist, the central spirit that that's what made America great. It's not rocket science. America largely never a perfect nation, but one the most God-fearing nation, arguably, and the most biblically literate nation in the history of civilization. And the most blessed, I believe, in accordance uh, with, in pursuant of uh, that great faith, knowledge of the Bible, and the fact that even you didn't even have to be a born again Christian, Kevin, to understand right from wrong. Back in the day, people that weren't even Christians, they knew and they revered and they respected, uh, you know, the great Christian leaders of the day, like Billy Graham, for example. Mm. Um, Right? And people yeah. knew right from wrong. Yeah. Now we're living in a time, yeah. as Ray Comfort says at the beginning of my book, he wrote the foreword. I was very blessed and honored that he wrote it. He says, we drink iniquity like water. Yeah. He says, uh, but nowadays children can have swallowed into a whirlpool of filth in a matter of seconds. Yeah. And our sinful natures don't resist for a second. We drink iniquity like water without a solid biblical knowledge of God that produces a healthy fear of the Lord. This generation cannot survive. And you know what? I agree with him, Kevin. Greg, we're not playing we powder puff. Fo- we're not playing powder puff football anymore. Uh, I think nope. that's going to be clear for our kids. They may be facing persecution, have a, no idea exa- exactly what they're going to be facing in the year twenty thirty five or twenty forty five. But you want to prepare them for it. What's the vision for preparing your son? You've got a couple of chapters on uh, directing your son, challenging him. You're called to be sexually pure. You're called to preach the gospel. You should be narrow minded. You're called to be a seed planter. You, what do you want him to do? What do you want him to be when he's 28 years of age? I want him to lean not on his own understanding, but in all his ways acknowledge the Lord and know that the Lord will guide and direct his path. See, my son knows, Kevin, that I'm his earthly father. I'm not his heavenly father and, I ne- and, and will never seek to be his heavenly father. He knows that I make mistakes, and he knows that when I do, that usually, most of the time, <laughs> Lord willing, I go and I repent and we hug it out, and I let him know that I'm a human being in need of the same mercy and grace of our Heavenly Father. Yeah. And, as, and, and so the, 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 in the big picture, Kevin, to answer your question, I want my son to know that his Heavenly Father created, that he's not an ape, that he's not, the, that he's not an animal, that he's made in the image of God, that he's not to act like an animal, that he has a divine calling and purpose on his life, and that he has a mission, and that he is to be... Uh, serving the Lord in everything that he does. And that, then that's why the first chapter of the book, I think really, and, and that's why I cho- chose it to be the first chapter of the book, which is that seek first the kingdom. That the, all these people, Kevin, these days, all these books written about what your purpose is, the purpose driven life. Everybody's, you know, I hear Christians saying, I'm still waiting for the Lord to reveal my purpose. Well, let me save you some trouble. You know, go to, go to the Bible, because, you know, Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all the things will be added unto you. You know, we all have God-given gifts and, uh, uh, you know, talents and stuff, and we go to the Lord, and he reveals those, and it's our job as parents to cultivate those, to nurture those in our children. But the bottom line is that I want my son to know as dark as things get, that he can trust the Lord that his word is true, that his promises are true, that he can lean on the Lord, even if things don't make sense to him, even though the persecution that might arise, that will, uh, we know, that already is increasing exponentially, and that is going to exponentially increase to epic proportions, I believe, in the very near future, but that he can know, be of good cheer, because the bottom line is that when you have Jesus, when you have salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everything, you already have 100% victory, and you can live like it. You can, because, you know, the bottom line is, it's not your best life now, and my son knows that. It's, it, if it, and if it is, we're in trouble, Kevin. Yeah, if this is right. our best life that we're going to have, yep. we're in serious trouble, my friend. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's for, that's for <laughs> sure. All right, 40 things to teach your children before you die. 
uh, by Greg Jackson. And it's a neat little book, guys. It's a neat little resource. I can't think of one to add. I, honestly, I'm, I'm going down the list of f- the 40 chapters, and we're talking about an uh, 80-page book here. This is, this is something you can read with your kids five minutes a day for a couple of 30, 40 days, and you're there. Uh, but I'd encourage you to grab a copy of this neat little resource. Hey, Greg, thanks for joining us on Generations today. We appreciate your energy, appreciate your vision. Well, I appreciate it, Kevin. It's been a great honor and a blessing. Continued success in in your ministry. Keep fighting the good fight, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon, brother. You bet. It's uh, gregjackson.com. That's with three Gs. gregjackson.com for a copy of your book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die. This is Kevin Swanson inviting you back again next time as we continue to lay down a vision for the next generation. Hello, brothers. As a fellow man, I understand the intimidation that comes with shepherding a family. Sometimes I don't even know how to use the scriptures to help my wife and children or others within my church. I want to be able to lead others. How can I be equipped? Well, Generations with Vision is hosting the fourth annual Shepherds Conference from October 5th through the 9th in Elizabeth, Colorado, just south of the Denver Metro. At this conference, you can get real answers to your questions. Interact with experienced pastors and shepherds and learn the importance of biblical doctrine in shepherding and discipling others in their family and church. You are invited to join Kevin Swanson, Marcus Servan, Scott Brown, and other pastors from October 5th through the 9th in Elizabeth, Colorado. To register, go to generationswithvision.com forward slash shepherds. That's generationswithvision.com forward slash shepherds. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. Notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on the Internet or are several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice of cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a time so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. In just a moment, Generations with Kevin Swanson. But first, this... The World View in 5 Minutes. It's Tuesday, May 26th, 2015 A.D. This is the World View in 5 Minutes. I'm Adam McManus. ISIS has captured the city of Palmyra as it continues its rampage across Syria. And now they are executing hundreds of citizens 
while most of the population has fled. ISIS controls about half of the country. Have the Iraqis lost the will to fight off Muslim rule under ISIS? That's the indication provided by the Iraqi deputy prime minister in an interview with CNN on Monday. He said that he was surprised to hear that their best trained units left Ramadi to the ISIS forces. That the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets up over it the basis of men. Daniel 4.17 In the providence of God, the drought in California continues and floods in the southwest. Hundreds of homes have washed away due to flooding in Oklahoma and Texas. At least three people are reported dead, many more missing. Have Americans grossly overestimated the size of the homosexual force? That's what a recent Gallup poll found. Amer Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. American Family News, I'm Chris Woodward. You can add another name to the list of people seeking a party's nomination for president. Former Senator and presidential candidate Rick Santorum threw his hat in the ring Wednesday for the Republican presidential nomination. He joins an already crowded GOP field that is expected to grow in the coming days. Meanwhile, the New York Times reports that former Governors Martin O'Malley and Lincoln Chafee are probably going to seek the Democratic presidential nomination, as well as former Senator Jim Webb. They would join Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders in running for the Democratic presidential The next president will have his or her hands full when it comes to foreign policy issues. The Secretary General of NATO said Wednesday that Russia's aggressiveness goes far beyond Ukraine and now includes weapons deployment, provocative overflights, and nuclear exercises. Russia's nuclear saber-rattling is unjustified, destabilized,